Welcome. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. It's been quite a year for our sustenance series. The OHC, as we call it in short form, has co-sponsored fully 50 events across campus on the sustenance theme, many of them linked to our own programming. And we've hosted six major lectures of our own as part of this year as well. We began with Terry Tempest Williams in November, who spoke on the sustaining grace of witness. Then Van Jones came in January and spoke on Beyond Green Jobs, the Next American Economy. Richard Louvre was here in March to address the restorative power of the natural world. And we had Willie Forbath in April on human rights. Is it the socialism of the 21st century? Just a couple of weeks ago, James E. McWilliam, <laughs> James e. McWilliams was here uh, to talk about thinking beyond the food movement. And those of you who were here know that there was a lively discussion after that one. <laughs> now this, our final event for this academic year, will be the capstone on a year of reflection, discussion, and a call to action. We're especially pleased to bring the series home, quite literally, by inviting back a local authority on what sustains us. Kathleen Dean Moore is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and University Writer Laureate at Oregon State University. Yeah, settle in, just make yourselves at home, move that tape. <laughs> Moore is an author, an environmental philosopher, a teacher, and a speaker. She's also the founding director of the Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the Written Word at OH OSU. In her writing, she takes on our moral, spiritual, and cultural relationships to the natural world. Four books from the last 15 years or so are made up of nature essays. These are Wild Comfort, The Solace of Nature from 2010, Hold Fast, 1999, River Walking, 1995, and The Pine Island Paradox, 2004, which was the winner of the 2005 Oregon Book Award. Her latest book from 2010 is Moral Ground, this very book, Ethical Action for a Planet in Peril from Trinity Uni University Press in Texas. The volume is co-edited with Michael P. Nelson, Professor of Environmental Ethics at Michigan State University, and it is this project that will be at the heart of Professor Moore's talk this evening. In case you haven't yet looked at this book, let me tell you just a little bit about Moral Ground, Ethical Actions for a Planet in Peril. The premise of the book is that, quote, environmental emergencies are a moral crisis as well as economic or technological problems, and they call us to lives of justice, integrity, and compassion. That quotation was from a radio interview that Moore and her co-editor did on Seeding Chicago. To sound that call to action, Moore and Nelson collected short contributions from more than 80 moral leaders from all across the world, all of them calling us to honor our obligations to leave to the future a world as rich in possibility as the world we inherited. And that's a quotation from the book and the book's website. The contributors to this volume include Barack Obama, Thich Nhat Hanh, E.O. Wilson, John Paul II, Ursula Le Guin, Barbara Kingsolver, and Catherine, uh, Kathleen Dean Moore and Michael P. Nelson themselves. I was very happy to see among the contributors Mary Evelyn Tucker and Terry Tempest Williams, both of whom we've hosted in the last couple of years here. The foreword is by Desmond Tutu, who addresses it to, I quote, all the people of the world. The book consists of 14 sections based on recurring themes, including virtue, survival, gratitude and reciprocity, religious belief, compassion, justice, and our, responsibi our responsibility to our children and the earth itself. Finally, the argument is that, quote, our moral integrity requires us to do what is right, unquote, plain and simple, and that is section 14. Each section is followed by a short ethical action section that suggests action items. To move the conversation from out of the pages of the book to a more public forum, the editors have been holding town hall meetings on the topic in states all across the country, including in Portland and Corvallis here in Oregon. The aim is to galvanize everyone to action. Moore said that what she wants to do is to begin individuals starting down the right road. 
When unsustainable practices are described as an injustice, she said, that can quickly shift the locus of power in the country. And change is indeed brought about by a rising wave of moral affirmation. But she will describe this too much better than I can. Just a few practical remarks, therefore. Professor Moore was good enough to do a really wonderful UO Today interview with me for TV this morning, which will be up on the website in a couple of weeks, so you might want to watch that as well. I'm very happy to acknowledge that the funds to, br to bring Professor Moore here tonight were provided by our endowment for outreach in the arts, sciences, and humanities, which makes many things possible we couldn't otherwise take on. Thanks to the rest of the staff of the OHC, and this is really heartfelt at the end of a long and very busy year. Thanks to Julia Hayden, Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Lindsay Hendrickson Rogers, and Jonna Ireland. We're a six woman team, it keeps a lot of balls up in the air at the same time. Please note that after the talk, there will be a book sale and signing out in the hallway just where you came in. And we'll have a question and answer session. You see the mics in the aisles as we usually put them there. The talk is being recorded, so we'd like to ask you to come to the mic so that your question is recorded along with the rest of the conversation. If you have mobility issues or prefer not to stand, we can bring a, a handheld mic to you. That's all I have to say. I'm sure you're eager to hear our star speaker of the evening and our final speaker for the sustenance series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kathleen Dean Moore. Well, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Julia, and, and what a great honor it is to be here under the auspices of the Oregon Humanities Center. And how nice of you to have chosen this most extraordinary day, probably the most beautiful day on your campuses today. Everything, everything in bloom. You know, E.B. White, the wonderful essayist, said, you know, I get up in the morning and I don't know whether to save the world or savor it. <laughs> he says, it makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> And I am with him on that. It does. What, what a beautiful set of days we have been having. And this, of course, is my great privilege to do this work in the world, which is the work of savoring. That's what nature writers are. They are professional savorers. Um, and uh, it, it's only been very recently that it's been clear to me, it's become clear to me, that it's not enough. Savoring is not enough. It's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Uh, for carrying out your responsibility in the world. And, you know, I love to describe frog song, but it isn't enough to, to do your best work to describe the joy of a frog song as frog species are vanishing one after another and as the frogs in our pond grow four hind legs. And it isn't enough. It isn't enough to extol the healing power of marshes when marshes are being buried under the Kmart parking lot, stinking of tar, and it will not do to describe as well and as beautifully as you can the spawning behaviors of, of trout and, and salmon as they disappear from our rivers. So it was very clear to me that um, if, we love this, if we love this beautiful earth, if we are in love with this particular instantiation, this set of organisms, this set of, of rivers and, and their beings, then um, we have to save it. We have no choice. Um, and we have very little time. So let's start right there. Uh, where do we start? My um, co-editor Michael Nelson and I were sitting down and we said, well, you know, when we talk about this work, where should we start? Michael's a very wise man. He says, well, you probably ought to start at the beginning. So um, let's do that. Let's start. <laughs> let's start with the Big Bang, shall we? And this great sudden gushing forth of matter and energy and the streaming out and the spiraling of star matter spinning into galaxies and suns and planets. How extraordinary this is. And then on Earth, and maybe only on Earth, the evolution of these life forms, and the evolution of imagination and conscience. The evolution of beings who can turn around and gaze back at the universe. The evolution of beings who can explore the meaning of themselves and, and through which the universe can explore the meaning of itself. I want to pause on the wonder of this. I want to pause on the wonder of the evolution of these synapses that allow us to celebrate, that allows the universe, the universe to, to celebrate itself. We are 
the beings through which that extraordinary thing happens in the universe. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. So here we are at the end of the Cenozoic. I think it's fair to say it's the end of the Cenozoic, the last 65 million years. And those 65 million years have been the most lyrical of the planet's years. It's during that time that this world came into its full flowering. It's during that time when we had the evolution of the trees and the flowering trees and the songbirds and the plants and the coral reefs, the great northwest forests, the great northwest children. It's during this time that the earth became so rich and complex. And so it happens that in our generation, as Thomas Berry points out, we have been able to do to the earth what no previous generation has been able to do because they lack the technological power. And we have done to the earth what no future generation will ever be able to do because the planet will never again be so beautiful and full of life. We didn't have to do the kind of damage that we're doing, but we did. And it's ironic, I think, that it's we who, who were the ones who brought ethics to the earth. It's we who brought the conscience to the earth who turned out to be the biggest, heaviest-handed thugs. Can't get over it. But, so here we are, 4.6 billion years of history, of evolution, and it has come down to this, and I think it has come down to the claim that we, you and I, the people in this room, even those of us who are senior elders in this room will probably live to see the end of a way of life on earth. And what's not clear is whether it's going to be the emergence of new forms of human goodness and new patterns of living and new uh, flourishing of civilizations on earth, new creation of biocultural communities in an integration that we have never seen before, or whether it will be a slide into a degraded and degenerate and dangerous and brutal world that we can't even wrap our minds around. I used to say, you know, I used to give this talk not very long ago, and I used to say, it's going to happen in this century. That decision point will happen in this century. And then, you know, a year went by, and I had to say, you know, it's going to happen in our lifetimes. And then I was able to say, I think it's going to happen in this decade. Now James Hansen has come out with the latest runs through the numbers, and he's telling us that the peak year, the key year, is going to be 2012. If in 2012 we can manage to stop the increase in the warming gases and actually achieve a reduction of 6% as we reforest massive parts of the world, then we probably can succeed in stopping the changes of the climate and, and maintaining this balance, this climatic stability that has nourished life on Earth. If it's going to happen in 2013, then we're going to have to achieve a 12% reduction. And he didn't have the figures for 1214 as far as I know. But the point being that, that uh, we've, we've run out of time and how ironic it is that uh, this year of decision is also an election year. 2012, that's our, that's our year. So given all this, one of the things that I think is really strange is the way life goes on and how many people are not paying attention and how many people are not talking about it in quiet voices, making sure the children don't hear because you would not want the children to understand at this point. Uh, talking in hushed voices about what, what we are faced with. Uh, it's so strange, the silence. Uh, Derek Jensen says it this way. He says, he says what, if it were, what if it were aliens who were doing this to the Earth? What if aliens landed their spacecraft on the Earth, all of these green people jumped out, and they went very busily about wrecking the world? What if they um, poured poisons into the rivers? What if they soaked the rivers with estrogen and Paxil? 
What if they, what if they killed one out of every ten species of organisms? What if they scraped the tops off the mountains and dumped those tops into the river valleys? What if they laced the agricultural fields with poisons and sprayed the orchards with poisons? What if they seeded cancer in our plastic products? What if they emptied the osk aqu- aquifers and made our rivers basically undrinkable? What if they warmed the planet so that the the forests were eaten by insects and then torched? What if they turned our democracy over to the tender mercies of the corporations who might actually be some kind of aliens themselves? These... (laughs) These persons who have no consciences, an alien life form, what if they injected carbon dioxide into the atmosphere until even the climate turned on us? What if they loaded up all the resources for themselves and left nothing for our children? What would we do? That's what Derek says. He says we would probably do something more than change out our light bulbs. Take that, you aliens. (laughs) I don't know if it would call for war, as you say, but it would certainly call for the greatest mobilization of our imaginations that the world has ever seen. Uh, so, so this leads me to the premise of what I want to say this afternoon, and that is that, that as, as Barbara indicated, climate change is, it is a scientific issue, and it's a technological issue. It's surely a, an economic issue. But it's primarily and fundamentally a moral issue, and it calls us to a moral response. Here's, let me just kind of tell you what I believe and just be as straightforward as I can about it. I believe, I believe that it's not just stupid or uneconomical. I believe that it's morally wrong to take what we need from the world to support our comfortable and profligate lives and to leave for the future a ransacked and dangerously unstable world. I don't believe that's worthy of us as moral beings. And furthermore, I believe that to let it all slip away, to let it just slip away all those beautiful lives, to let it be all extinguished, all those sparkling consciousness, through what? Through being too busy to pay attention, or through indifference, or through recklessness, to let it all slip away, those billions of years of evolution that it took to create the song in a frog's throat, or the the stripes in the throat of a lily, To let it all slip away, that's an abomination and is not worthy of us as moral beings. Consequently, I believe that we have an affirmative moral obligation, individual and collective, to leave a world as rich in possibility as the world that was left to us. And if we understand what the scientists are telling us, and if we affirm these moral principles, then we have no choice but to take action. But it's these moral impulses, it's these moral principles, these moral imperatives that have pretty much gone missing from the public discourse. We talk a lot about the economics of climate change. We don't talk very much about the obligations. So that's what I've been trying to do. I call it the second premise project. Uh, Scientists, bless them, have been heroic in their efforts to tell us to achieve this global consensus among scientists that climate change is real, it is dangerous, it is upon us. What happened? Nothing. So what did they do? They redoubled their efforts. They tried to speak in 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 one voice. They tried to respond more effectively. They created alliances with the journalists, again, telling us what is true, what happened. (laughs) Nothing. And the scientists are just tearing their hair saying, We believe that if they only knew, if people only knew, then they would take action. But you know what? That's that's a logical fallacy. And let me tell you why. It's a practical error and it's a logical error to think that facts are enough. So here comes a practical syllogism. You invite a philosopher, you're going to get a syllogism. (laughs) Goes like this. Any argument that has as a conclusion a statement about what we ought to do. It's going to have to have two premises. The first one is factual, often based on science. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world will be if we continue in this way or that way. But from a description of what the world is, you cannot draw a conclusion about what we ought to do. For that, you need a second premise. You need a normative premise. You need a premise that tells you what we value 
or in other words, short words, what the world ought to be. This is what is good. This is what is worth valuing. This is a kind of life that fulfills the potential of a human being. This is just. This is not. This whole discourse about what we value, and what we think is good, what we think is worthy of us. If you have a description of the way the world is, and if you have a clear understanding of the way the world ought to be, then you can draw good conclusions, wise conclusions, cogent arguments leading to conclusions about how we ought to act. But if you only have one of those, then you will not have a conclusion. So the argument goes like this. If we don't act immediately, then anthropogenic environmental changes are going to bring serious harms to the future. Scientific claim. Second premise, it's wrong to harm the future. You're going to grant me that? You don't have to. I'm going to work on that all, all for an hour here. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, if, those, if you believe those two premises, if you affirm those two premises, then the conclusion follows that we have a moral obligation to act to avert that harm. So what I'm saying is that we need to do the work of the second premise with the kind of energy and public involvement, and I might even say public funding, with which we are doing the work of the first premise. That's the, where the work needs to be done. So who does the work of the second premise? Where does it happen? It happens in art. It happens in poetry. It happens in literature, all the forms of storytelling that civilizations create. It happens in philosophy. It happens in religions. It happens in civic communities. Again, people getting together, telling stories about what is valuable and good. It's the work of families, parents talking to their children. But you know what? Traditionally, the work of nurturing conversations about human values takes place in universities. Imagine what, what an extraordinary thing for the university to be the great convener of these national conversations about what is good and worthy and just and true. Um, that's what I'm calling for. Now, people say to me, oh, Kathy, you are such a philosopher. Don't you know that people don't talk about values? You know, politics are moved by economic self-interest and by the realities of the marketplace. Change is created by technology. Ethics has not made a difference in the world. Well, you know what? That's just misreading history. And if you look at American history, you will see that every time this society has made an abrupt, dramatic change, it's been because of a rising wave of moral affirmation of some great principles. Right? So you look at the uh, Declaration of Independence and the War of Independence. Uh, certainly there were economic interests at play there, very strong ones. But mostly that was the result of a rising affirmation of great principles of human rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Um, look at the uh, emancipation of the slaves. A terrible long time coming, but when it came, it was based on shared ideas about what is human decency and what is not, and it was moved by one of the great forces in American history, which is people walking together out of the churches, into the street. And if you look at the civil rights movement, the most beautiful example of this, I have a dream was not a dream of a growth economy. I have a dream was a dream about the children and the rights of the children and compassion and duties of justice. Uh, and once again, it was driven by people sharing a moral point of view and walking together out of the schools, out of the churches, into the streets, affirming something that they think is a beautiful affirmation. So, um, so I don't think that this is irrelevant, this talk about ethics. In fact, I think that the open question that we have to address is will we be able to make the moment that we need in response to climate change and envir environmental degradation if we don't come up with this same moral affirmation of the rights of future people and duties of compassion and justice? I think that's a big question. So Michael and I started out on this project that Barbara was telling you about. We asked about 125 of the world moral leaders to respond to the following question. Do we have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as our own? Please answer us, we said, in any genre you'd like, but keep it to 2,000 words or less. <laughs> Yeah, 
Try saying that to some of the people in this book. <laughs> Editing was fun. Um, we got back some beautiful responses. They were essays, they were articles, they were prayers, they were proclamations, and an astounding number of them were letters to their children. And we chose 83 of them and we put them together into this book. What we're trying to do is what they do in murder trials, where uh, you've heard of parallel pleading, the, um, the notion of parallel pleading, where if you have something really important at stake, you're not going to only make one argument. You're going to throw every argument at that judge to save your client. You're going to talk about the witnesses. You're going to try to make this legal point and this one and this one. Well, we're doing the same thing, parallel pleading. We're not looking for the one best reason to act on climate change. We're looking for a panoply of reasons, reasons from every corner of the world, reasons from every worldview, so that no matter what your worldview, you will find a reason to act to save the, the planet. Um, so what did we learn from the project? Well, two th let me just point out two things. One thing that we thought was very interesting, it sounds loud and clear from almost every writer, and that is that we are at a point of fundamental change in our worldview, that the world is, under, is in one of those times when we are going to have a paradigm shift where we will just go flip and we will have a different way of viewing our place in the universe, different answers to the fundamental questions, questions like what is the world, what is the place of humans in the world, and how then shall we live? It used to be that you could represent the worldview this way that people used to think that we were separate from the world, that this is the world, all that flowing green stuff, that's the world, and that human beings were the star, and that all that beautiful green swirling life supports us, who are distinct, who are best, who are most powerful, and blaze with the most beautiful light. That um, we are in power over the earth, that we are in control, that the earth was created for our use alone and drew all its value from its useful to us, to us and that we had no obligations except um, to those um, that serve us or our species. But ecological science and almost all the uh, religions of the world tell us that that view is false and deeply, deeply dangerous. That We've been through that experiment where we tested whether that hypothesis of who we were in the world, we tested it by living. And we have come to the end of the experiment and the results are clear. Believing that is not going to get you to a sustainable, livable, just place. So what we're seeing now is an entirely different view of the world and that is partly fed by ecology and partly fed by many other religions of the world. And the idea is that humans are not apart from the world. We are, in fact, deeply integrated into systems. You see that black dot? That's us. And what we see here is a, a, a um, diagram of the energy links between the different, different organisms on, on the Earth. Uh, humans are part, then, intricately interdependent parts of this delicately balanced systems of living and dying, and that uh, because we're part of the Earth's systems, we're utterly dependent on their thriving. Can we imagine, here's our challenge, there were ways of living and there was a moral theory that grew out of that Christmas tree view. Can we imagine new ways of living? Can we imagine emergent forms of human goodness that are based on this new picture of who we really are? That, I think, is our challenge, uh, our moral challenge, is to invent these new, new ways. The second thing we learned, the second thing we learned is that there are many, many arguments about why it's wrong to wreck the world. Why must we, must we, change our usual ways of acting in order to save a world that's beautiful and life-sustaining? What are the moral principles that will, will take us forward? What are the new self-evident truths? And what are the values? What is the new dream of justice? Do we have an obligation? Uh, what we ended up with were a beautiful set of reasons. Do we have an obligation to the world, to the future, to leave a world as rich in uh, possibilities as our own? Yes, for the survival of humankind. Yes, for the sake of the children. Yes, for the sake of the earth itself. Yes, for the sake of all forms of life on the planet. 
Yes, to honor our duties of gratitude and reciprocity. Yes, for the full expression of human virtue. Do we have an obligation to the future? Yes, because all flourishing is mutual. Yes, for the stewardship of God's creation. Yes, because compassion requires it. Yes, because justice demands it. Yes, because the earth is beautiful. Yes, because we love the world. Yes, to honor the earth and earth systems. And yes, because our moral integrity requires us to do what is right. One reviewer said that she didn't know if that was a table of contents or a prayer. <laughs> Let us pray. Do you see that each one of those statements is a second premise? That each one of those statements will link us from a scientific description of where we are to an affirmation of where we must be based on some view of the nature of our moral obligation. So I've just read you a whole list of, of second premises. So I've chosen five of these reasons, and I'd like to um, talk about them in particular. I, I tried to choose some that I thought would speak particularly to you. Uh, I chose ones that would speak to me, um, obviously leaving many aside. So I wanted to talk first about our obligation to the children. You know, what is it about little children that we feel such an obligation to leave a world to them? I thought a lot about that, and I think it's that they are innocent, that they have done nothing wrong, and that a small child can never deserve to suffer. A small child can never deserve to suffer because she can never do the wrong that might merit suffering in return. So the suffering of any child is unjust. But we are harming children, even as we believe that we're acting to provide for them. You know, I, I, I was talking about this, the book in Corvallis as it was, and a man came up to me afterwards, and he got like this close, which wasn't very much fun because he was about this tall. And he had his finger in my face, and he said, Professor Moore, I care more about my daughter than I care about anything else on this earth. And I am going to make as much money as I possibly can. I am going to amass enough wealth that I can leave her in a privileged position and guarantee her a healthy, happy, long life. And I go, oh, dear God. <laughs> and did I, ask, I didn't say anything to him because I didn't think his little you know, collar button was going to be listening to me. Um, but what I wanted to say is, we think, think about what we do to the privileged children as we try to provide for them. You know, think about just what it means to amass wealth in these, in these times, the damage that that oftentimes incurs, and just think about what we give our children when we give them these gifts, about the poison in the plastic car seat and the disease in the pesticide-treated fruits and the disastrous coal, co coal company and the college investment portfolio in the mall where there had been frogs. The irony is that the amassing of this wealth in the name of our children's future is what hurts them the most. And that's the privileged children. But what about the, the children who aren't children of privilege? What our decisions do to them isn't ironic. It's a moral abomination. That these children who live at the edge in so many different ways, at the edge of the continents, at the edge of survival, at the edge of starvation, at the edge of, of um, the, the poisonings that are going around the globe, that these children will, who will never know even the short-term benefits of the profligate use of fossil fuels are the ones who will bear the worst consequences. That's a damage to their future that I think is a deliberate, threat, uh, deliberate theft. So I would call this argument to your attention for your consideration if we have a moral obligation to protect children and if environmental degradation is manifestly harmful to them then we have an obligation to expend extraordinary effort to end those harms and redress the wrongs that we have done them. I was going to read you a little piece from Severin Suzuki. I won't have time to do that. I can already see that. But I was going to read you a little piece in which she is addressing the Rio Convention uh, as a 12-year-old girl. And the only sentence that I will quote is the one I have in my mind, which is, she says to these people, <laughs> I had it in my mind. <laughs> Something like, you say, it, it's not what we say that's important, it's what we do. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. I think, oh, man. 
The second argument that I've picked out for your consideration is one that's, been, that's based on um, human survival. Uh, if environmental degradation threatens the foundation of human survival, and if human survival is a value beyond all others. You going to give me that? I didn't think so. <laughs> that's why I set this up hypothetically. If... Environmental degradation threatens the foundation of human survival, and if human survival is a value beyond all others, then we have an obligation to avert the degradation that threatens our continued existence. And let me just read, because I love it so much, um, a statement that Daniel Quinn, the author of Ishmael, uh, made about this. And the analogy, I think, is really quite strong. He's talking about the massive conversion of biomass from all these organisms into the biomass of the human body. All these billions and billions of people, all this biomass, this human biomass, is really a conversion of this other kind of biomass. And he says, we are like people living in the penthouse of a 100-story building. Every day we go downstairs and at random knock out 150 bricks to take upstairs to increase the size of our penthouse. <laughs> Since the building below consists of millions of bricks, this seems harmless enough for a single day. But for 30,000 years, eventually, inevitably, the streams of vacancy we have created in the fabric of the walls below will come together to produce a complete structural collapse. When this happens, if it is allowed to happen, we will join the general collapse and our lofty position at the top of the structure will not save us. It's amazing. Third, I want to talk about justice, and there's so much to say about justice. If people have inalienable rights to life, liberty, <coughs> here we go. <coughs> if people have inalienable rights, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then the carbon spewing nations are embarked, are they not, on the greatest violation of human rights the world has ever seen. Because as we take away people's rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, systematic denial of human rights. By whom? By the wealthy nations who can't or won't stop spewing carbon into the air. From whom? From all these people who are blameless in this. And for what? For the continuation of wasteful and pointless consumption. But it's not just a violation of rights. Obviously, it's a violation of distributive justice, too, because what we have is that the people who are benefiting from the profligate use of energy are not the ones who are, who are suffering. So you have a distribution of benefits and burdens that's manifestly unfair. I want to particularly highlight an argument that I think is very strong on the issue of justice, and it's important because it comes from your campus. And you should be very, very proud of Mary Wood and your law school for the argument that they are not only developing but uh, which they are bringing to life in countless lawsuits all around the, all around the world. And here's the argument that they um, have made. Like the oceans and the rivers, they say the atmosphere is a commons. And it belongs to no one, and it belongs to everyone. Now, the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb carbon dioxide without unbalancing the climate, that capacity belongs to all of us as well. It is a commons, and it is to be held in trust for future generations. So to dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, to take more than your fair share of the self-healing capacity of the atmosphere, is a theft from the commons. It's a deliberate theft from what's shared. Now, she asks us, Whose job it is, is it to protect these assets, these commonly held assets, from degradation and theft? That, according to the common law of every nation in the world, is the responsibility of governments. So while we're speaking to in, about injustices, we can add to that list the looting of the atmospheric commons and the utter failure of governments to stop that, the utter failure of governments in their responsibility as stewards or trustees of the common trust. Is this making sense to you, this argument? And putting it, it, it's putting it nicely to talk about the utter failure of governments because, in fact, governments <coughs> and those who are looting the commons are often the same entity or at least in very close alliance. So we have a situation of collusion, too. So what Mary is doing, along with her um, colleagues, is launching suits in the name of the children to enjoin the governments 
to carry out their responsibility, their fiduciary responsibility as trustees of the atmospheric trust. We shall see where that goes. I think it's an extraordinarily brilliant idea, and I also think it's going to take a very long time. And we don't have time. At any rate, if you can find a way to help Mary Wood in the law school on this called atmospheric trust litigation, I hope you will do that. Reason number four that we need to um, do our, uh, fulfill our obligations to the future has to do with our love for the world. You know, um, we do love the world, don't we? I mean, this is a fact. Uh, although I have to say that my husband, Frank, who's a scientist, says that I really need data before I go around saying that. <laughs> that I, I shouldn't assume that people love the world. I, I should do some sort of study. And what's really kind of fun is that I have, and although he may not be really quite aware of it, um, <laughs> I, did it I did it for another one of my books. I did it for the Pine Island Paradox. And I tried to figure out what people really do love by looking at the love ads. And this is a really cool thing because if, if you look at the love ads in the newspaper... In 24 words or less, people tell you what they really care about. So if you just get out an envelope and you start making hash marks, you can collect very useful data <laughs> about whether or not it's true that people love the world. So I thought you might be interested in my results. <laughs> the data reveal. Frank says to always say the data reveal. <laughs> the data reveal that more people like the outdoors than any other thing. This is Corvallis. I bet it's Eugene. Somebody should do this study. And that uh, the, the typical single female who is a beautiful mama, 31, who is shy and honest, okay, like it, likes the outdoors, movies, and walking on the beach, in that order. And the typical single male who is a very fit male, who is very sensitive, <laughs> likes the outdoors, the outdoors, romance, and tattoos. But the point I want to make, and what I don't want you to miss, is that in both cases, the outdoors is first on the list. And it continues down the list. So after outdoors, the first runner-up was watching movies. Yeah. But beaches and camping tied for third place. Okay? Walks and hikes came in fourth. You know, there's a theme. Then came dancing and dinner followed by romance. And after romance, there was a three-way tie among cuddling, fishing, and country-western music. <laughs> although, although, none of the people who um, liked to cuddle were fishermen. <laughs> and there was one vote each for mountains, darkness, the blues, Harleys, hand-holding, friendship, and vampires. So what you see is that the data clearly reveal that people do love the world. <laughs> people do love the world. Um, Frank says, Kathy, he says, that's bad science. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> because the point that I want to make is a philosophical point. And once again, let me make it hypothetical. If you love the world, and who doesn't? If you love this beautiful, glorious, spinning green globe, the, the green fields and the lands, if you love it, then that love imposes an obligation on you to act in its defense. That's what love means, to come to the defense of something that you really care about and cherish. So this, this um, argument is the one that spoke most strongly to me, and so I wanted to um, read you pieces of the essay that I wrote uh, for, that, for that section. Um, it's called The Call to Forgiveness at the End of the Day, and I will read you about four minutes of it. Uh, let me tell you that it's set 15 years from now as I am in, uh, getting older and older, and here I'm looking back on the uh, years that have passed between now and 15 years in the future. You with me? Okay. May 25th, 2025. All those years, the Swainson's thrushes were the first to call in the mornings. That's when I would take a cup of tea and walk into the meadow. Swallows sat on the highest perches, whispering as they waited for light to stream onto the pond. For years, there were flocks of goldfinches. After my husband and I poisoned the bull thistles on the far side of the pond, the goldfinches perched in the willows. The garbage truck backed down the lane, beeping its backup call, making the frogs sing even in the day. I don't know how many frogs there were in the pond then. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Thousands. 
When the eggs hatched, there were tadpoles. I have seen the shallow edge of the pond black with wiggling tadpoles. There were that many, each with a song growing inside it. In the years when the frog, forest, frog choruses began to fade, scientists said it was a fungus, or maybe bullfrogs were eating the tadpoles. No one knew what to do about the fungus, but people tried to stop the bullfrogs. Standing on the dike, my neighbor shot frogs with a pellet gun, embedding silver BBs in their heads a dozen holes, until she said, how many holes do I have to make in a frog's face before it dies? Give me something more powerful. So she took a shotgun and filled the bullfrogs with buckshot until legs snapped, faces caved in, they slowly sank away. Ravens belled from the top of the oak. When the bats stopped coming, they said that was a fungus too. When the goldfinches came in pairs, not flocks, we told each other the flocks must be feeding in a neighbor's field. No one could guess where the thrushes had gone. The fields were as empty as the perfect emptiness of a bell, the perfectly shaped absence ringing the Angelus, the evening song, the call for forgiveness at the end of the day. As it happened, that was the spring when our granddaughter was born. I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but even then not so many as before. By then the pond had sunk into its warm weedy places, leaving an expanse of cracked earth. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. Birds and the butterflies fly through the land. Go to sleep, you little baby. She fell asleep in my arms unafraid. I will tell you I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon finches and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again the little lick of music, that grace note toward the end of a meadowlark's song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. So now we come to hope. We hear discouraging things about hope. And I think it's true that our options are limited and our cities and our homes and our transportation systems are disgracefully designed and the destructive ways of living are protected by tangles of profit around the world. Corporations are behaving like psychopaths. We have run out of time. The most conscientious person is going to have a real hard time making a difference. Bill McKibben, our friend, states that challenge to moral thought. He says, the chance that we will, in fact, leave to the world, leave to the future a world as rich in possibility as the world that was left to us is nil, as in not going to happen. We have effectively ended the Holocene, the 10,000 years of climatic stability that allowed human society to establish itself and then to flourish. And Gus Speth, the former, former dean of the Forestry College at Yale, says, all we have to do to destroy the planet's climate and ecosystem and leave a ruined world to our children and grandchildren is to keep doing exactly what we are doing today. So we have a problem. And one of our problems is that we live in a society, America, is fixated on the future. 
That's not true around the world. But Americans measure the rightness and wrongness of what they do by its consequences in the future. Utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, the risk-benefit analysis. So because of that, we have, we have created a society that is easily disempowered by hopelessness. In other words, we, Americans, are very inclined to believe that if we can't make a positive difference, there is no point in acting whatsoever, and we have then the wholesale abandonment of our moral responsibilities. But notice that this is a fallacy too. The fallacy is a fallacy of a false dichotomy, of thinking that we have hope at this end, and we have despair at this end, and failing to notice this huge area between them, which I would label acting out of integrity. So integrity, doing what's right because it's right, creating a life in which what you most deeply value is embedded in the decisions that you make, acting in a way um, so that the meaning of our lives are in the way we act. And I believe that, that even if we can't mm, preserve the world in its present state, we still, even if we can't make changes in that world, we still can make changes in ourselves. And we can create lives for ourselves that are rich with meaning, rich with purpose, rich with the kind of joy that comes when we are part of communities of caring, and rich with the kind of freedom that comes when we wake up in the morning and saying, today, I'm going to get to do what I think is right. So often we wake up, I, today, I'm going to do everything I think is wrong. <laughs> I'm going to go to work in a car I don't believe in. I'm going to hop on a plane I don't believe in. I'm going to work for a university half the time I don't even believe in that. I'm going to do things that I think are destructive of the world today, and then I'm going to go to bed and wake up again in the morning. We don't have to live like that. We can <laughs> proclaim our, our freedom from that sort of thing. Now, I am going to have to move very, very quickly, and which is really too bad, because now I've come to the part about what are we going to do. <laughs> and I do have some ideas that I want to share, but let me, let me just share them in, in outline form and then um, suggest that... Uh, we might discuss them in another, in another forum. What, what can we do? What is the nature of our work? I don't know what we're each going to do, but I do have some ideas about the shape that that work might take. One thing I think is true is that we can refuse to make ourselves instruments of destruction. We really can refuse to let corporations transform us or reduce us into consumers only. We can, we can refuse to volunteers to be foot soldiers for corporate destruction. We can say hell no to the growth economy, to the corporate expansion, the way soldiers have often said hell no to senseless wars. This is a call to restraint and mindfulness. This is the light bulb thing. This is the bicycle. This is the local food. This is the well-insulated home and the recycled paper and the secondhand clothes. This is the potluck and the garden and the birth control pills. This is the poison-free yard and the rosemary bushes. What it is is conscientious objection. We know conscientious objection and how it works in war. We will not participate in what we think is wrong. We will not become foot soldiers in a war that we think is unjust. Well, then maybe we shouldn't be foot soldiers in this war of the aliens against all of us. So that's the step one, I think, of getting our own house in order. And let me just say that I, I, I wrote to my, f my f colleague at Yale, Tony Lacerowitz, and I said, you know what, here's what I want to know. He runs polling all over the place. I said, I want to know if you compare that group of Americans who are deeply concerned about climate change with those are who are in the group called either dismissive or deniers, I want to know if there's a difference in their carbon footprint. Is there? No. No. So obviously, step one is to get our own house in order. And uh, what he suggests is to make it easy for other people to do that too. So we can be the pioneers. We can say, here's how to do it. This is a fun way to do it. And we can, by being inventive and creative in our own lives, we can, um, we can invite people. We can show people how it, how it can be done. And I think that's the first step. And as we do that, we will be accomplishing the second step, which is to align our lives with our deeply held values, um, it, it, to imagine and bring into being new ways of living on the land that are bright with art and imagination, nested into families and communities. 
the uh, East Coast theologian named Frederick Beekner says it this way. He says, and this is what I tell my students. He says, people ask me, what is my calling? I said, he says, your calling is at the intersection of your deepest joy and the world's greatest need. Your calling is at that place where your deepest joy intersects with the world's deepest need. It's joy-driven, but it's also aware and mindful of the needs of other people. What, what changes can you make in your life that would embody your passions and, and, and take what you most deeply believe in and let you be a leader in imagining creative new ways to do that without being destructive? Thirdly, I think it's important that we don't turn our backs too quickly on grief. There really is strength in sorrow, and we come together in sorrow as we look at what we're losing. I think that in many ways our hearts are breaking, um, but we have to follow the advice of Leonard Cohen in this. And what Leonard Cohen said was, yeah, yeah, our hearts are breaking, but that's how the light gets in. He says, we live in a broken world, and we live with broken hearts, but that's no alibi for anything. We have to sing the brokenhearted hallelujah. And I think that's right, too, that we, we, we make our hearts vulnerable so that they will break, so that they will let in new ways of being creative and new ways of living, and so that we will find this, this hallelujah that rises out of the, the glory. It's a measure of how much we care. And then we can honor our gifts. Um, my friend Robin Kimmerer says, you know, if you want to know what your responsibilities are, ask, what are my gifts? So the robin has a beautiful voice. That is its gift. So its, re its responsibility is to raise the sun up in the morning. And the salmon has this beautiful gift of its red flesh. Its obligation, its obligation is to feed the people. What is your gift? What is your gift that you have been given? What are you good at? What is your gift? Are you a writer? Are you a graphic designer? Are you a snowboarder? Are you a professor? Do you organize? Are you raising children? Take that gift and make that be your, your way in the world. The gifts that we have may not be welcome. We may not welcome the responsibility that come with them. That doesn't matter. Brian Doyle, a wonderful Portland writer, says, you have been given a gift. If you dishonor that gift or if you don't exercise that gift in the way you live your life, that is a sin. So one of my students is writing this essay. It's in the voice of a mother salmon. And she's saying, hey, I don't want to um, fertilize this river. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I, I don't manage in that life for myself. And uh, the point that he's making, of course, is that it doesn't matter. If that's your gift, then that is your responsibility. So uh, I think that we can, in these ways, make the moment. And, um, and what I'm suggesting is that the moment is now and that the moment is unfolding as this election comes forward and that 2012 is our year, and that we can take our ideas to the streets in creative ways. We can find ways to express our ideas in powerful ways. We can make our politicians understand that this election has to be about reducing fossil fuel use or won't be about anything at all. And we can make our elected representatives understand that if they can show us a good plan to reduce warming gases, then we'll vote for them. And that if they fail in that, then they can go back to Drain or Sweet Home or wherever they're from. And they're going to have to go back fast. So once again, we know what social movements mean. They mean people moving out of respected institutions together and coming together with this great wellspring of affirmation of shared ideals and that that's how we make the moment that we need. That's the work that we have to do together. And it's the answer to the world's emergency call for new, new forms of human goodness and I think it's work of substance, and it's work of joy, and it's work of mad attentiveness. It's the real deal. That's why we're here. So let me just close by reading you Gary Snyder's poem. Maybe you know it. Say it with me. For the children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up, as we all go down. In the next century or the one beyond that, they say, our valley, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers. 
go light. Thank you very much. We can take a few minutes for questions and answers. I'd like to invite you to the two mics in the aisles, or we can bring you a microphone if you need it. And I'll recall for you also that there are books available outside, which Professor Moore will be signing down here afterwards. Any questions? Um. Thank you for all your words. My question is, um, as most of my questions are, comes as a mother. And um, as someone running as fast as I can, it feels like. And with the new Republican, I think it's the Ryan budget, the proposal, is that what it's called? The Ryan budget, the nasty right wing budget. I have this sense that um, I feel called to do this work and I'm wanting to do this work and with my children, but I also have this sense that everything is crumbling around us and that we have to fight for um, more and more of the basic things to, to hold on. And so I, um, I guess my question would be, uh, how do we pull together all the various fragments of society that are working for all these separate things. I have friends working for gay marriage. I have friends working for um, the schools. We're all battling in Eugene right now for the school funding, and that takes a lot of parents' time. And often we'll say to each other, can you come to this rally? Can you sign this thing? And, and often the answer is, it's not my issue. I'm, I'm burning out on this thing, or I'm taking care of my aging mother now, or... Um, so I guess, I guess my question would be, is there any thought that you might have about how we can link together all of these things better, the justice and the, and the environment and the, the children's needs and education and, de and democracy? So I know that's a, a big question, but that's the one I'm wanting the answer to. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Do you all know Mary? She was one of my students at the class that went up into the mountains, and she wrote a perfectly beautiful song about sitting in a circle. Um, Mary, I don't know the answer to that. I do know a couple things. And one is that when, um, when Frederick Buechner says, you know, your, your, your calling is at the intersection of your great joy and the world's great need, he didn't say your great joy and all the world's terrible needs. He said the one that you choose to be the deepest need at that moment. And I imagine that that's a moving target. Um, so I, it is true, and people say it to me too, you know, you, you don't have to do this alone. There are all these other people out here who are doing other things too, and if we all, take a, if we all use our energies in the thing that is most important to us, then we uh, will make the moment. I don't know about the premise of your question about how we bring all our efforts together, because I'm not sure if what we need is a central kind of coordination of all our efforts, or if we need uh, just a more flourishing grassroots effort. Uh, because um, people like Paul Hawken point out that we are in the midst of the most extraordinary social movement in the history of the world. We just don't see it because it's happening in so many places and at such a small scale. But there really are more than you, uh, what, I can't remember his number, 12 million organizations working for sustainability and social justice all around the world. And, and um, you know, I could ask you right now to raise up the number of, of your fingers corresponding to the number of those sorts of organizations you're involved in. Let me see them. Just think about how many of those sorts of organizations are you involved in that are in some way working for sustainability, social justice, education, democracy. Okay, I see three. I see five, ten. I think. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, it may be that, uh, that this isn't the time for some sort of great central 
effort. It might be that just all is going to happen all around us. I don't know. But I think on this election, it's going to happen when we all... Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you this. It's just an image that's in my mind. It's in, I'm, in, I'm in Wyoming, in, in Laramie, and it's a, it's a parade, it's a homecoming parade, and it was after Matthew Shepard's murder, and everyone, and everyone is, is parading through Laramie, and we're all standing on the side watching this parade go by. And as the parade goes by, people peel off the curbs and they join that parade. And so the parade, the farther it goes, the bigger it gets. And the more people that watch, the fewer people are watching and the more people are participating. And the parade is going along and the band is playing and there's nobody, nobody watching this parade because everybody is in the parade. And that seems to me that that might be an image for what we'll get next. I don't know. An easier question or I'll just go ahead and sit down. I, I, I don't know that it's easier. Uh, I'd like to hear your comment with regards to uh, an area that's kind of a sacred uh, thing with regards to uh, children, motherhood, and population and the balance of all of that. Um, when you say it's a sacred thing, I think that's exactly right. I think motherhood is a sacred thing. And I think that the reason it has become so very difficult for us to talk about it is because it's um, that so often we've been... I think that our early conversations about um, birth control were in some ways insensitive to feelings of people who have been told that they're the ones who should control their numbers, not me. Um, so, so I think that we need a new conversation about, about um overpopulation, and it's going to have to be one that is really fair and that really recognizes the interests that all of us have in, their, in our children and doesn't dump all the load of reducing numbers off onto one particular group of people. If we can make that, if we can create that kind of conversation, then I think it's a very important one to have because the facts are plain. I mean, this is no surprise to anybody that the Earth has a limited carrying capacity and that there's a certain finite number of resources and that as human beings grow they will reach that point of finite resources and that will be the end of growth. And how that growth then slows down um, is in many ways up to us. Is it cataclysmic? Is it about war and uh, murder and starvation and disease that limits our population? Or is it by the application of our incredible imagination and our moral imagination and our sense of um, fairness and the ability to plan ahead? So yes, you're absolutely right. We need we need a huge conversation about about overpopulation, and it needs to be fair. Thank you. Um, so, for people of a younger generation, um, what do you think it would be possible for them to do in uh, this possible flourishing that may or may not happen? <laughs> So is your question about what you can do to bring that flourishing about or how you might live in well, this new flourishing well, world? Well, well, I, 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 yeah. What? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, I guess mostly it's how we can enact it, how, how we can, um, how, how people of a younger generation, when the time comes, can, you know, enact the flourishing that may or may not come. Um, so much I want to say to you. Uh, if I were to design a world in which young people were silenced, I would do many of the things that um, have already been done. I would um, be sure that they had their ears plugged and that their music they listened to was only their own so that they couldn't create any communication or, or, or um, any coming together. I would, make sh I would give them false dreams of material prosperity I would teach them in the classroom that science is science and ethics is ethics and that science facts don't have moral consequences so that I would instill in them a really good sense of irresponsibility. Um, okay, that said, I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for young people to get really, really angry. I'm waiting for young people to recognize that the future that's being taken is theirs. I'm waiting for them to think, to understand that it's the selfishness the, the interest in making, in, in blind interest in accumulating power and money that is taking away the possibility that they ever will be able to live a decent life. Um, I'm waiting for them to get really, really mad about that. And um, that will be a good thing, I think, because the, um, 
because the moral power of young people is a very strong, strong and beautiful thing. Thank you. They're clapping for you. <laughs> Don't get mad. <laughs> yes, please. I'm pretty angry. <laughs> and <laughs> one of your first points of action recommendations was to um, align our lives with the deeply held values that we have. And I'm wondering what your recommendation is other than do your best um, might be for the capitalistic society that we live in? Um, you might make a list of the things that are in your control. Number one, what you eat. Number two, what you wear. Number three, the things you buy, the material goods you buy. Number four, the classes you take and what you say or don't say in those classes. I mean, that's going to be a very, very long list of things that you control. Then you might uh, try to make a list of the things that are really beyond your control. And it's probably important to be honest about that, too. And I imagine there'll be things going back and forth on that list as you think about that. And then, you know, start with number one of the things you control and take charge. Start, then go on to number two of the things you control and take charge. And what's fun is to, is to do that uh, in conversation with other people so that, uh, so that you're not lonely in your in your disruption, but that's so that what you're doing is, is you're creating a new art form, which is young people's lives. You're creating this new kind of street theater, which is young people's lives. You're taking the things that young people, students in particular, are so good at, which is, by the way, sharing. Sharing living spaces, sharing cars, sharing meals, and uh, making that the basis for, for living. Uh, and, and I think that's what you'll find, is that this this maybe would be inventing the kind of um, new, new way of living that this young man was asking, asking for, too. Um, challenge the people who say what you don't believe is true, particularly if they're professors. <laughs> challenge the professors who don't raise all the questions in their classes and allow you to silo your knowledge. Say, I don't want to learn about carbon chemistry unless I'm also going to learn about the ethics of overloading the atmosphere. Um, insist on an education that gives you, the, make a list of what you need from this education in order to be an effective, powerful mover in this world and insist that the university give you that. Sit down with your professor, your advisor, and say, here's what I need from you. What have I forgot, for forgotten for on this list? Now, how am I going to get that? That's start. <laughs>